please welcome Governor John Rowland. I wasn't sure when I saw two Rollins up there. My, my, I was afraid my wife had maybe participated in the introduction. She, <laughs> she might have a little bit to say as well. And uh, I'm, I'm happy that I'm not giving the presentation on marriage as Tony Robbins did in some of the videos. That was really helpful. When I, when I get home and start staring at my wife tonight, she's going to think I've lost my mind going <laughs> to Darianne. I'm going to blame you guys if I do anything goofy in the next 48 hours. But... I'm going to try it. I don't know about all of you. I'm going to try that. And uh, we've been together. Uh, we go back to high school, so she knows me pretty well. She sees me doing this. I, I, I think it's, it's probably not going to fly, but perhaps I'll give it a shot. Um, Peter, I want to thank you for the creative introduction. Um, I, quite frankly, have never had one like that, but uh, uh, I appreciate you doing just the good stuff, too. I mean, I, I'll cover the other side. Someone asked me about the, uh, the introduction that you see that... Uh, is in the publications and the websites. And I actually put that together where I said the good part and now the bad part. And uh, so um, I've had some fun with that as well. Um, and I, I also want to thank Paul. Um, Paul and Lisa put on a, a beautiful dinner last night and, and we had a chance for real fellowship. And I hope all of you get a chance to do that throughout the year because you, you really get a chance to drill down and get to know each other. And uh, it, was very, uh, it was very fulfilling. And I needed it as much as everybody else did. It was, uh, it was just a, it was a great evening, and I appreciate that very much. Um, I know we're not supposed to um, ask for advice or give advice, I should say, but I'd like, will someone ask for my advice? Chip, yeah, Chip wants my advice. So he wants my advice. So it's been asked for, which is NC, NCS rules. Um, and a and, uh, few people here, Ken Dixon and Chris Healy, have heard this story, but uh, it rides on again. And I torture my children whenever we go out to dinner or go out to lunch because I always ask the server's name. <clears throat> and I've found in my experience that probably one of the most powerful tools in communication is having somebody else's name. And when I ask that server your name and they say, oh, my name is Joe, and they all of a sudden they stand upright and you get a little bit more attention. And uh, so that's kind of been my fun thing to do for the last 20 or 30 years. And, and I should share with you that I, I kind of learned this uh, tool, if you will, from, for those of you with a lot of gray hair, from General William Westmoreland. How many of you remember him? <clears throat> so I got to know him back in the 80s, and he used to tell a story on himself, which I never forgot. And uh, when he was the Supreme Allied Commander during the Vietnam War, he tells the story that he called down to the vehicle depot one day, and some young kid answered. And he inquired to the young kid, hey, I want to know how many vehicles there are in the garage. And the kid said, oh, just a moment. He said, okay, there's uh, 14 passenger vehicles. Um, he said, there's 83 vans. He says, there's 13 trucks. He says, oh, yeah. He says, there's one Jeep for that stupid general. <laughs> so Westmoreland said, uh, do you know who this is? The kid said, nope. He said, well, this is General William Westmoreland. The kid, dead silence. Finally, the kid said, well, General, do you know who this is? And the general said, no, I do not. To which the kid said, goodbye, stupid. <laughs> so that's my advice, Chip. So um, I've been asked to talk about how I ended up coming to prison fellowship um, and kind of the path that I've gotten there. And, and I'll tell you, I have some propaganda over there, which I would encourage you to grab. There's some annual reports. I even have my card there, uh, and I would encourage you to, uh, to take a look because it's an incredible, incredible ministry. Uh, a little bit quiet in this part of the, of the country, but it's huge across the Bible Belt and, and certainly out west. So I, I would encourage you to, to look into that ministry, and, and that's all I'll say about that. So um, I was teasing with Chip a little bit earlier that um, I have the extraordinary... Uh, let's say, unique opportunity to be one of the 67% of those that return to prison. And uh, I, I look back, and I'm sure all of us, I think I said this last night, we look back in our lives and we look ahead in our lives, and I had a friend in prison who had a great line. He said, you know, there's only three stages of life. There's the time as you enter into a crisis, there's the time you're in crisis, and then there's the time you come out of the crisis. And I thought, well, that's a very pessimistic view of the world. 
And I thought about it. I said, you know what? But it's true. Because if we think that, you know, everything is smooth sailing and everything's flat and everybody else has a better life and everybody else has a better circumstance and so forth and so on, life's not fair, as we all know. And what I love about NCS is that there is an honest sharing of our values, our feelings, working with each other, and, and it's extraordinary, and it's unique. Um, and so l let me share with you that I, I won't get into the details of, you know, kind of how my life started, but you saw the picture with the mustache, and yes, I was very young. And sometimes when you have early success, with that early success, there's not grounding, maybe there's no wisdom, uh, maybe you don't have somebody mentoring you, so you, you're kind of winging it. And, and I was blessed to have early success, and it went on for quite some time. But God has a, a way of kind of adjusting our lives. And, and I, I brought the, uh, Chuck Colson's book, Born Again, uh, wrote this 43 years ago. And some of the things he says about the world 43 years ago are so true today. It's just kind of scary uh, how things either haven't changed or, frankly, have gotten worse. But Colson says something in the forward. He says something to the effect that God has to break us to remake us. And I know we'd like to believe that that's not true and we can do it on our own. As my wife and I used to say, allaboutme.com. Uh, but I'm afraid it's, it's not that way. I, at least it's not been my experience, and I'm sure that's true of everyone else's. So I look back, and the first thought I have is, wow, I've had all these great successes, you know, the other Roland, if you will. Uh, but what have I done with the tragedies? What have I done with the, the hardships? Uh, Peter mentioned that we have five children. Well, we have four children uh, because we lost one of our children to an opiate overdose about eight years ago. And uh, when we were sharing last night, we were talking about those of us who have been through divorce and financial hardship and the loss of a loved one. And I was the last one to speak, and I thought, oh, my goodness, I've pretty much had all of those unique problems, challenges, and through all of those, I continue to ask myself, what is God's purpose? What is God's plan? Uh, why did this happen? And, and, and frankly, not spending a lot of time on the why, but spending a lot of time on the now what do I do? How do I use this? Um, <clears throat> and so, as you know, as, you know, as uh, Peter referred, um, after three terms in Congress, I resigned. It was humiliating. It was embarrassing. Uh, it was difficult. I, I went away for 10 months. Uh, when I came back, um, I built my life back. And again, that's kind of the before the crisis, during the crisis, and after the crisis. And what's, what's, what's intriguing is that the second chance opportunities in our society and the redemption and people's forgiveness are extraordinary. And, and that comes from God. Uh, that comes from our faith. And there are people that may not forget. Perhaps they're not of faith. So as I, as I returned home, returning citizen, Derek, you know about that. You're experiencing it right now. It's hard. Um, but I was fortunate. I was blessed because I kind of got back in the saddle again. And uh, as was mentioned, before I knew it, um, I was headed for a, a radio show. And, and one of the things, one of the challenges I have is not filling up what I call the pride and ego boat. I kind of use the analogy that I think, for me, life is like a boat. And when you're in the boat and you're filling it with pride and ego and allaboutme.com, there's not a lot of room for God. And so that's kind of our natural inclination. I, I want to win this job. I want to win this election. I want to get this promotion. I want to make this deal, whatever it may be. And so, interestingly, I, when I was asked to go on the, uh, the radio, a couple things had happened. One. I was blessed that God put someone in my life a year before my life fell apart the first time. Pastor Will Moradi, which some of you may or may not know, but in around 2001, uh, I met Pastor Will Moradi. This was about a year or so, a couple of years before I resigned from office. And he was a charismatic, evangelical, wonderful pastor. And we kind of connected. And um, he said, you know, I'd like to come and, and talk with you and Patty and Patty was going through some issues and so forth. And I'll come to the house. I said, really? Yeah. He said he'd bring his wife. And I thought, OK. I said, but listen, you're a little crazy on this God stuff. So you need to, to bring that down a few notches. If you want to come and just talk and hang out, 
that's cool, but no God stuff. He said, okay, no problem. So he came on Monday, and we chatted, and we had a nice hour or two together. He said, well, maybe we'll come back next Monday. I said, okay, but let's keep it social, keep it light, keep it superficial. And so the next Monday he came. And, well, all right, well, one more Monday. Well, we spent the next 12 months doing Rick Warren's Bible study. And he brought me, <laughs> by the way, that's how you do it. <laughs> you don't say, hey, here's the Bible, come on over to my house, you'll scare everybody. And so slowly, over a year's period of time, I learned. He brought me to the Lord. Um, and what I didn't realize at the time was God was putting him in my life for a reason. And that's the fun part, I think, when you look back to see the people that God puts in your life to get you through those crises and get you through those hardships. And so now, all of a sudden, I get the chance to go on the radio. And I said, well, this is great. I, it'd be exciting. I said, but I want to bring my pastor with me. And TIC said, what? I said, I'd like to have him on the show with me. I said, listen, has the guy had any radio experience? I said, nope. He said, here's what the job pays. Now, if you want to share it with them, knock yourself out. So I said, okay. So we started the show together. We called it Church and State, and we had a great time. And we were very political, and we talked a lot. I, I always said that I was the church guy. He was the political guy. And <laughs> a little bit of truth to that. And uh, we had a great run. And then all of a sudden, um, I, I'm finding out that uh, I'm being investigated. And, um, and I'm like, about what? I, I, I couldn't kind of grasp what had happened. And finally, my, one of my the lawyers went to see the, the prosecutor. And the prosecutor said, well, he said, um, two young 36-year-old kids, call them kids. And um, they said, hey, your guy didn't do enough time 10 years ago. We're going to get him. That's not good. Uh, for those of you that have been incarcerated, that's not good. And if you watch what they're doing to the leader of the free world, if they decide they're going to get you, they're going to get you. There's no question about that. And I don't say that as an excuse. I say that as reality. So off, this, off we go, and we're on this adventure. And before I know it, I'm going to trial. I'm losing the trial. I'm going to the appeal, Supreme Court, and I'm now heading out for 15 months. What I got to tell you about the defining moment for me was when the indictment came down. I was down in, in New York, and I was beside myself. I was embarrassed. I, I couldn't believe it. People would say, how could this happen again? I couldn't explain it. I never had a venue to explain it. But I didn't care about explaining it to anybody. But what I was worried about was my wife and my children, and how are we going to deal with this? And I've got to tell you that one of the reasons I'm working for Prison Fellowship is that when you're in that pit, and all of us have been there, you start to lose hope. And, and that's the scariest thing in the world, and you start to lose hope because everything else falls apart. And I'll never forget walking out of my lawyer's office and going over to Bryant Park and sitting there and just praying, saying, I God, I can't believe this is happening. How is my family, how are they going to deal with this? How are they going to get through this? How is my wife going to get through this? I went away. I resigned from office. We, we lost her child. How, how, how can they ever deal with this? And I lost hope. I lost hope sitting in Bryant Park. And I'm always an upbeat guy, optimistic. And I was as down as you can be. And I thought this was the end of my life. And then I, my two daughters came down, and we went out to dinner, and I started to tell them what was going on, and they just stopped me. They said, Dad, don't worry about it. We got this. And I just stopped right there, and I knew that God was working through them. And I knew that my prayers and my faith as I sat in Bryant Park were answered. I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it because that moment, my hope was restored. With one simple sentence, Dad, we got this. Off we went. My daughter had to change her wedding. She had to move her wedding up six months so I could walk her down the aisle before I went away. And there I was, sitting in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, in the middle of nowhere. As I sat there, I thought, what's the, what's the purpose, the meaning, the reason behind all this? And again, I decided it's time to readjust my life, and I thought about Chuck Olson. God has to break us to remake us. 
And so I did Bible study, and it took that time for spiritual growth and got through it. But I'll tell you what resonated with me. And Chip and I and others have talked about this. I knew how blessed I was. I was going home to a loving wife, children, finances. I had a stable home and friends. I had a driver's license. I had a high school diploma. And I looked at all the faces around me. They did not have that. Nothing close to that. Nothing close to that. No family, no finances, no friends, no resources. Not even a driver's license, not a high school diploma. And maybe 10 years of, of time under their belt, and they were coming back to society. When Chuck Colson wrote that book, there were 440,000 people incarcerated. Today, there's 2.3 million that are all coming home. They're all coming back here. And I resolved my, myself at that point to try to, in some way, shape, or form, do something about it. I'm not sure if it was a retail thing or a wholesale thing. Didn't really know. I just, I trusted God was going to steer me in the right path after this latest adventure. So I get out. Matter of fact, I was out in May, just not, not too long ago. And um, so I get out, and I'm not sure what to expect. Out of the clear blue sky, I get an opportunity presented to me, which was perfect. It fed my pride. It fed my ego. It filled my, my boat. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is great. My wife was like, this is this is redemption, this is cool, this is fulfilling, this is extraordinary. You're back on top. It's all about you.com. No, she didn't say that, but that's what, we say about our, that's what we say about each other all the time. But in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, and you've all been there, I don't think that this is the path. I, I don't think that this is God's plan. I don't think this is what I'm supposed to be doing. But if that's the case, what am I supposed to be doing? And so I pursued this reluctantly, the, opportunity that was before me, and kind of a, you, you've never heard of coincidences, there's no such thing as we know, they're Godstances, or whatever you'd like to call them, there's no such thing as a coincidence. When I was away, someone had sent me a card, they said, hey, there's this guy from Prison Fellowship, his name is Craig DeRoach, he's head of advocacy, he was a speaker of the house in Michigan, would you please call him, or re reach out to him? And I sent him a note when I was away, I said, hey, when I get out, I'll give you a call. And so I called him. I was kind of cleaning up things. I was about to sign my contract a couple of days away. And I called him. I said, hey, Craig, how you doing? He's a fellow politician. We talked politics for a while. And the Speaker of the House, he was instrumental in all the advocacy things that have been going on, the First Step Act and the criminal justice reform that was just signed uh, in Washington this week, or I should say mentioned this week, but signed a few weeks ago. <clears throat> So he said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I've got this great opportunity, so forth and so on. I said, but Craig, it doesn't feel right. I didn't go through all of this to do this. He said, well, come work for us. I said, really? What, what can I do for prison fellowship? Incidentally, 12 years ago, I ran into Chuck Colson. I, I think it was an NCS event. We talked about that. It was somewhere. And he asked me to work for him at that time. I said, oh, no, I've, I've got bigger fish to fry. That's Chuck Colson calling. <laughs> who's, who, who's not with us? <laughs> Which is, and I said, uh, you know, he said, well, what, come work for us. And I said, doing what? He said, well, we, we'd love to have you take care of the Northeast. I said, oh, sure, the land of the frozen chosen. I said, we don't have a lot of believers. There are probably all the believers in this room, and probably within 20 square miles. He said, we're, we're really lacking. We need somebody to develop, and we need someone to market, and so forth. And I said, I don't know. That. I said, really? And I thought about it, but more importantly, I just prayed about it. And I said, well, let's run down the path. And if we get all green lights, I think I'll do it. And so I had to put the other job on hold. And I just went to talk to my daughters, and they said, Dad, that's what you should be doing. Because I do have the unique skill set of having men running prisons, and being incarcerated. Not too many people can brag about that. <laughs> so I have a unique perspective. I know the ins, I know the outs, I know the ups, I know the downs. And so um, I said, all right, I'm going to do it. And whenever you make those decisions and you say, all right, is, is this the plan? You know, I don't know about you, I'm always looking. If this is the plan, that light will flicker. 
Don't we wish it was that easy? You know, if this is the right thing, I should be doing. But God has other ways of operating. So I start the job. I had to turn down this other, more lucrative, more satisfying, ego-filling, pride-satisfying job. And so um, I started a lot of traveling. So literally three weeks into the job, um, I have to go down to the Harvard Club for an event in New York. And we have 50 donors there. And my first experience, my daughter works in New York. I said, honey, would you like to come? You, you talked me into this. She said, oh, sure, Dad, I'll go. So she shows up, and we're at the Harvard Club. And here's this returning citizen, which is what we like to be called right there, a returning citizen from Rikers Island. He'd been out about three weeks. Three weeks, right? That sound familiar? And here's this guy. Imagine, this. Imagine you doing this. Rikers Island, three weeks, young guy standing in front of 50 people in a Harvard club you know, with steak tips, giving his testimony. It was extraordinary. All he talked about was how prison fellowship changed his heart. And that's what prison fellowship is about, spiritual transformation. And, you know, listen, I'd like to think everybody's going to return home and be good citizens, but you need spiritual transformation in order to be a better person. Ephesians describes it well. And so... Um, he finished. It was great. My daughter's walking me back to the train, and uh, she turns to me as i about to get on the train, and she grabs me. She says, Dad, she said, I'm so proud of you. So like all of you, I got on the train crying, and I just prayed and thanked God that this was the affirmation I was getting, that this is what I should be doing. This is the purpose, that serving someone beyond myself. And I'm so blessed to have this opportunity. How crazy does that sound? That I'm not doing the other ego-fulfilling things, that God has given me an opportunity to serve him and to serve those in need. And it's a blessing. It's a blessing to go back to prison a second time. This guy's a little cuckoo. Uh, but it is. And it was reaffirmed. And I think we probably we'll all have some of those opportunities in our lives and some of those challenges. And it's, it's not complicated. Um, we just have to be ready, willing, and able. I do want to um, share with you, and, and has anybody ever read Born Again, Chuck Colson? Yes. It's awesome. It's, it's, just, it's just a great book. And the fact that it's been 43 years. And in the, in the introduction, he says, Born Again. For me, it is anything but a cliché suggesting that someone has arrived at some state of spiritual superiority. <clears throat> it means only a fresh start at putting my life in order, but it had to come with the renewing of my spirit. As I have fallen down, picked myself up, and fallen down again during the past few years, I am learning how God can break us in order to remake us. And my most sincere and humble prayer now in this time of judgment is for a revival of the fl flagging national spirit. It can come in only one way, as each of us bows in submission to him and as the Almighty leads us from the darkness into light so that once again we might stand together, truly one nation, under God. And Chuck Holson said that 43 years ago, my goodness, in this crazy, uh, my wife and I call it, upside-down world, spiritual warfare that's going on each and every day, the national scene, the local scene, in our families, in our churches. Um, what an incredible time it is for us to share our faith, to witness to others, and not be afraid. Amen. Thank you, and God bless. Amen.